that are on Twitter will have seen Ken on Twitter lots. I looked at something like 7,000 tweets, Ken. Maybe it was bigger than that. It's a big number, though. And join me in welcoming Ken. Well, thanks, everyone, for having me here today and allowing me to speak. Um, I live in a farm in Bruce County, uh, two hours north of here. It's probably one of the prettiest and nicest places to live in Ontario, if not Canada. I am on Twitter, at Ken Shows, so all the content that is on uh, this slide deck today, I've pulled off my Twitter account. It's all off our own farms, and uh, hopefully you find it interesting. So I've looked at lots of conferences, meeting agendas, speakers that's going on in the province here this winter, and I see that I'm the only guy that gets to stand up in front of 400 people and talk about manure. So. I mentioned I'm on Twitter and uh, have met uh, lots of interesting and smart people uh, like Blake Vince. And uh, Blake and I have finally met each other the other night at the reception. I've had many conversations with Blake and he's always said, Ken, you got to help me out, get me some manure, get me some cattle down here in my area. There's, I need manure for my cropping and something's got to eat these cover crops that we grow. So I was talking to Blake's neighbor back in the summer and and uh, Blake's neighbor was over visiting him in the spring and he was out standing in his rhubarb patch and, and uh, he said, what's wrong, Blake? And he said, well, my rhubarb, it doesn't look very good. The leaves are bad looking. There's no growth. And to make matters worse, it tastes terrible. His neighbor goes to him, Blake, have you tried any manure on it? And Blake says, no, that's okay. I prefer sugar. <laughs> so... <laughs> This is a laser, so I can. <laughs> but uh, so no more manure jokes, I apologize. Uh, when Woody asked me to talk about uh, manure and strip till, I thought I'd be probably better qualified to talk about uh, cattle and feeding and that. But I'm going to give it my best shot, show you what we do here today uh, with our manure and uh, liquid manure in particular. So a little bit about the Shouse Group. Uh, my father, Wally, started it uh, in 1971. He's still very active in the business today. I joined him 30 years ago uh, with the cropping, the farms, and the uh, office staff. There's 20 in the team. Uh, we raise very good cattle. We ship on average 800 head per week into the Ontario Corn Fed Beef Program here in Ontario. Um, I'm very Ontario Canada uh, pro. Um, this year we're going to have 3,000 acres of crop in the ground. Uh, we grow as much crop as we can possibly feed. So our end market for most of it is right into our own feedlots. So what we do, we, uh, we order, the business started by order buying feeder cattle. So cattle's a big part of what we do, so is cropping. We bring calves in out of Western Canada. That's some Charlotte steers that are on grass in the Ferndale Flats in Northern Bruce County. We turn steers that look like this into steers that look like that. That's a pen of cattle that are ready to go at our Alston yard, and that's our final product. Our Alston yard is a 3,000 head feedlot uh, slatted floor operation. It also has a steam flaking feed mill on it, and we mill 600 ton of Ontario corn per week. Our Walkerton yard is similar in size, uh, cattle capacity, and it's also the base for our farming operation. It's also a liquid uh, cattle feeding facility. So for years we've just been putting the manure on top of the ground, uh, splash panning it on, getting rid of it. And uh, five years ago we started incorporating it and, that's just, and then we started tankering out with trucks and keeping the equipment off the roads. But that system after a four inch rain made us wondering, you know, what is going on here? Where's our manure going? We just, just put it on two days ago and we worked it up, it looks so nice and now it, it's rutted up and it looks terrible. So it got us into a search for a new system of farming and handling the manure and growing crops. We switched to a shallow, we got rid of all the shanks, so we got rid of the plows, we got rid of the deep rippers, and we switched to a shallow high speed tillage program. We started with cover crops, and last year we were at 95% cover crops. And in the last two years we've had zero fall tillage. We still splash pan manure on the surface. We do it in smaller amounts, and uh, we put it on growing cover crops. So right in here, 
is some corn silage ground, came off September 4th. Shortly after, we put on into the living cover crop that we seeded in the middle of June. This is what it looks like shortly after it comes off. Uh, we put 2,000 gallons, followed up with another 2,000 gallon splash pan on the surface. I have no fear of where that manure is going. So our search for a system came up. Uh, we looked at systems in Europe. They were very expensive. We uh, contacted Nick at Husky Farm Equipment and said, what's out there, Nick? And he said, have you ever looked at strip tilling? And I said, well, you know, I've looked at lots of options of strip tilling, but I don't know how we get the, the manure into the strip till. And he said, let me design you a system where we can, you go find yourself a good uh, strip till unit, the one you want, and I'll plumb it and engineer the tanker. So we came up with this. It's a 6,200 gallon Husky tandem axle high flotation tire tanker. It's got a used Remlinger strip till unit. I couldn't convince myself to, for the first version, to spend $25,000. So this one cost uh, about 10% of that. Uh, we mounted it on the back, we plumbed it. We still have the splash pan uh, option on there as well. And uh, that's what we're using. The row unit, so it's a Remlinger strip till unit. Um, starts off with, at the front here, a set of floating Martin row cleaners. Followed behind that is an is a opening disc with a depth gauge band on it, so it only goes down about four inches, three to four inches. Followed behind that is the shank, which is adjustable and spring-loaded with, with a small, narrow opening shoe on it, the bottom. In behind that, you can't see it because of the disc, is a rectangular tube which places the manure right at the very bottom of the opening. At the very top of that is a cup, it transitions to a round three-inch coupler, so we can, if something becomes plugged, we can uh, unplug it. And behind that, to close up the strip, is an 18-inch uh, concave notched disc. So, of course, there's problems because it's manure, and uh, I'll just go through a few of them. So, as we're doing this, splash panning, you're covering the ground uh, 35 feet wide. We're doing 15 feet wide here. It's for sure a slower process, and it takes twice as long to do it. Um, large amounts of residue, so as our cover crops became better and, and the corn stalks have gotten heavier, uh, we've got some plugging at the back end of it. Uh, those concave discs are going to be replaced with straight notched discs uh, to cover up that strip. Maximum is 4,500 gallons per acre, depending on soil type. But if we go any more than that, we're getting some bubbling up uh, to the surface again. So 4,500 gallons and less is what we're using. And uh, you know we're trying to prevent it from bubbling up, so that's why we're going with a smaller amount. Couple of, or, uh, one afternoon, the guys asked me, Ken, we need an extra guy in the strip till unit. First load out, I uh, got to, was using it. This is what happened. And I didn't have any gloves, so that's how my day went. <laughs> There's lots of things I could have said about manure in there. So the benefits, uh, that's an easy one for us. We're placing the manure right where it belongs. We're doing it with very minimal surface disruption, and that was our goal at the beginning, was to find a system in place that we can inject that manure into the ground without lots of soil disruption. At the top, you'll see a, a field of soybean stubble. This is a month after it's been in, uh, stripped into the ground, and that's at 4,000 gallons, and that's on a sand farm north of Hanover. This one here is some uh, wheat ground with some red clover, which actually looked, it's better than it uh, actually looks there. We stripped 4,000 gallons into that. Our ultimate setup is after uh, wheat. We no-tilled a four-way cover crop into it. Once the cover crop was established, we stripped 4,000 gallons into that. And for us, we know that that manure is being absorbed uh, readily and for the rest of the growing season that fall. So the process, we're loading a match-sized tanker. So a 6,200-gallon tanker loads at the feedlot transports the manure to, a, to the field edge. The tractor unit never leaves the field. We want to keep this equipment off the road. There's no mud, there's no traffic congestion. All the busy roads, we've built a uh, landing so the manure trucks are doing this all off the road as well for safety reasons. And the, track, or the truck uh, unit pumps it off into the tanker. So very, very simple. We're using a John Deere uh, Green Star system for making the strips. 
So once it's stripped tilled in, we have uh, the rows. So there's some soybean ground as well. Um, you can see we're at about five inches of depth here. Very, very shallow, narrow band of ground that gets worked. And this has been in the ground a month. Uh, I looked when we did it, and that's about what's left of it. What's lacking in this picture is roots. So I went back to the, the uh, cover crops with the tilled radish in, and I started digging to see what we have. And this is the radish roots from three inches to the center of that row. I've, I don't see radish roots growing like this without the strip. So they're, they're feeding on it. They're pulling that nutrient back into, the, into there as well. So I think what's going on is uh, you know, we're, we're translating, or translocating that, uh, that nutrient back into the ground here in different places. So version two, there will be a version two because uh, we've, we've been at it for two years now. We know what we like and what we don't like. It's going to have uh, eight rows that fold. I'm not going to go down the road at 20 feet wide. It's going to have a flow meter on it as well so we know exactly how many gallons per acre we're putting on it. It's going to have a rate control system so if we speed up or slow down, it doesn't uh, put more or less on. We have to be able to do heavy cover crops. Um, you get into the heavy stands of uh, ryegrass and things like that, it, it will keep plugging up the knives on that. We're going to be able to plant on top of the rows, or we want to be able to. Um, right now we have a six row strip till unit and a 16 row corn planter. Um, we're not planting on top of the rows like we should be. Prescription possibly, so just like your fertility program, we feel we can take that prescription, the yield map, soil testing map, soil types, and match up where that manure can go and what we can use best. It's also going to have a cutting system on. Anytime I've ever unplugged one of those things, it's because there's an ear tag in it. And I cannot believe an ear tag can plug up that hose, but it does. We'll probably end up having another tanker as well, just so we can go uh, farther distances. So next, step for, next steps for us is to keep building our soils. We want to maximize the benefits of the manure and the land that we have. And I don't think we're, I think we're done buying land. It's getting too expensive and we want to improve and make best use of what we have. Um, I mentioned Twitter before, so there's Ed Hansen. Uh, Ed has mentored us through this whole cover crop process and helped me with uh, many projects. Um, we spend days out in the fields walking, talking, and, and digging. If you're not digging into your ground, you should be. So for me, last summer, uh, some of the highlights of my entire summer were having Peter Johnson coming up to the area, Bruce County Soil and Crop. We toured small groups. You learn lots. You ask the questions. You're with your neighbors, and you're at home asking the questions. Mazex had a, an agronomy day uh, last summer full of information. I encourage you to fill your pickup full of people and head out to these events. We had Stuart Sweeney up to our feedlot. Spruce Dale Egermar had a crop stay, had all the neighbors in, and Stuart Sweeney from Omafra. He's the only guy I've ever heard talk about what's going on below the ground. If you've never heard of him, talk from the base of a soil pit, put that at the top of your list. Uh, it's amazing the information that man knows. And uh, get him up to your farm, get your neighbors in, and spend some money, dig the soil pit. But I had no idea I had a band of carbon placed there 20,000 years ago by an old forest. Keep trying something new. So I mentioned Ed Hansen before. Uh, Ed mentored us. Uh, I'm pretty good at copying good ideas. So Ed had been doing this uh, air seeding cover crops into standing corn. Uh, we built a unit last summer. We thought we'd do around three to 400 acres of corn. It worked so good we did all 1,800 acres and we actually did 200 for the neighbors as well. I went through it as fast as I could because I know we're limited for time. Um, that, I'll just make one little note, there was a 46, our first full year of uh, cover crops followed up with uh, the stripping the manure in. There's a field at Walkerton here. Uh, it's a pioneer variety of corn. It uh, went 249 bushels at 26% moisture on 46 acres. I know that system's going to work for us, and it's a different way of handling manure, but I, I know it's going to work. So, Good. with that, thank I'll you very much, Ken. Excellent job going through that.
I will say, probably in the interest of time, if you have some questions, I'm going to encourage you to catch up with Ken, because yep. you're going to be around for the rest of the day, Ken. Yep, I'll be here. Yep. Yeah, catch Ken coming here to uh, one of the breaks.